But yes, the question basically is, why, to your mind, does it seem boring to stop thinking? Stop any and all description for two to five seconds as often as you can. Because that immediately calls forth the highest realization into your experience right now without suppressing anything. It's not about suppressing something, it's just about suppression would be replacing a thought with another thought that doesn't pay attention to that thought, to the first thought. It'd be like replacing one state of mind for say a unicorn or replacing like Monday and doing your taxes with um, <coughs> thinking about fluffy clouds, you know, that could be suppression. Um, not always, sometimes it's just a shift in focus. But it's about when you are triggered, it's about stopping the narrative to where you become completely, call it present if you will, or rather awake. And what you notice is this, which you cannot get rid of, the self that you can't get rid of. Call it love isness awareness, call it self, call it God, call it clarity, call it the infinite. You start to tap into that. And the more you de stop describing not by escaping in another thought that poses a no thought, but by actually radically interrupting the mind flow, like shocking it for two to five seconds. And breathing in the realization of what remains. Doing that over and over again undermines all of the assumptions that have caused these energy centers of our crystalline being to distort and become Fog, fogged up, so to speak. So it's a very quick way to balance and it will still take generally quite a bit of time, quite a bit of practice over months and years. But nevertheless, it's one of the fastest ways to quote unquote, clear out the energy centers as a result of this practice. What really helps to see is that you don't have that much time. We think we have our whole lives ahead of us, but some people in this room will be able to tell you otherwise. There's no rhyme or reason to old age. And even old age, you have to realize you're still in your toddler stages of what it used to be, what, what this vehicle used to provide in terms of a lifetime. So as Ross says, we are basically in a perpetual spiritual childhood. We never grow up. So we're never spiritually mature enough to realize what's going on within ourselves and therefore also what's going on within the reflection of the collective, etc. Not to get into those details, but just to show how, how much of a sheep we are is important to realize so that you can reverse that process. You can transcend that and take matters into your own will and begin a practice that suits you, that is as direct of a method as possible to realize your infinite self. For if you realize your infinite self, it's the fastest way to grow up. And in a way, we are, we are rushed because of the limitations of our lifespan. We are rushed to, and we are asked to be more motivated beyond our years than would be reasonable for this vehicle. And so in a sense, what's asked of you is in some ways unreasonable which is to be disciplined before your body mind vehicle is naturally capable of being disciplined. Why chase pleasure if you can chase realization of what you are instead and open the floodgates of love, bittersweet, infinite perfection. Bittersweet is only at the threshold. When you start to wake up, it's a bittersweet stage. Things are bittersweet because you're letting go that which you held on to and you're, just, you're, you're acknowledging both the widespread pain and suffering in the collective, as well as the total non-existence of it at the same time. You know, it's like you're departing, you're gradually departing from this state that you call being human, which is not true. You're not human. You've never been human. You've never even been a body. So how could you be human? But that is the exploration that begins to unfold. And I promise you, it's much more fun knowing yourself is infinite than it is thinking that you are the body that needs to chase pleasure all the time and avoid pain. It's much more fun.
fun is not the right word, but maybe to the mind that is easily bored. Fun sounds like a good thing. <laughs> oh, the infinite self is fun. Okay, I'll stop thinking for a bit. Let's find out how fun it is when I stop thinking. Well, it, it may not be fun at first. It is like digging a hole to find the water, digging for a well of water. You know, you gotta, there's some dry practice that needs to happen before the, you, know, you reach the wet practice, which is where the gravitational field of source starts to pull you back in. That's when you start to experience, you get closer to the gravitational field of the sun, of self, and it starts to pull you in, starts to pull you in, starts to pull you in. And that gravitational field from the self to the runaway portion of the self that you call yourself now is then sensed and felt as peace, bliss, freedom, happiness, passion for that, inspiration, desire. And this will accelerate your maturity and this will naturally begin to take over the, the occupancy of the false describing mind self to the realer self, shall I say, or you could say real self. Then it becomes just natural, like that's what you want because there's no pleasure that could ever compete with the peace and the bliss of what you are. So now you want to drop into that. Now you feel amazing when you drop your identity versus kind of like bored and stagnant. And now what? And now what disappears? It just becomes obvious. And after a while, you only want the truth. You only want more of the truth. And you want to purify your distortions or you want to relinquish your distortions and your illusions. And you want to give that up because they begin to feel like contractions rather than sources of hope and pleasure. Even pleasure becomes not unpleasurable, but undesirable, meaning it doesn't matter you start to give away your pleasure too. And when you give away your pleasure, there's a true bliss that comes in. So then you, it's like you experience your body having pleasure on the periphery, on the horizon of your vastness. But because it's not held onto, because there's no hope and meaning projected into it, it's a timeless event. Meaning that the timeless shines forth, outshines the temporary projection of that hopeful event. There's no hope in pleasure. There's no hope in pain. There's no hope in avoiding pain. There's no hope in accumulating pleasure. What, what hope is there? Like how long can you hold on to pleasure? And again, even if you were able to hold on to pleasure, which I wish we could, because then you'd get exhausted by it quicker. <laughs> you'd, realize, you'd realize it's meaninglessness quicker. You can see this in people that say, achieve their dreams, meaning like maybe they become movie stars, they become famous, they get all the fame in the world, they get all the money in the world, they get all the parties, all the chicks, all the planes, all the every, everything that their little uh, person dreamed of. And in a more gradual way, that's an example of people exhausting it. And after 10 years or so of that life, they start to find out that actually pleasure itself is very meaningless. So take it from them or take it from me. There is no meaning in pleasure. There's no fulfillment in pleasure. Pleasure is absolutely meaningless. When you realize the meaninglessness of everything, actually that's when bliss starts to happen. That's when freedom occurs or is realized. You're already free. The reason you think of yourself as separate and isolated and location-based is because you are currently giving, giving meaning to something. Whatever it is, even spiritual, on the spiritual search, we project a lot of meaning. And thus then we give away our power and our freedom and we project the self that we are into a lack-based or limited projection of that self. So meaning really in a sense is your enemy, not separate from you, but it's something to be mindful of and to release as often as you can. We're so attached to meaning. You know, when you post a question to people or when you even post the possibility that maybe things are meaningless, they freak out. It's so fun. <laughs> yes. One of their, mo their most prized possessions is that certain things have meaning more than other things. And if you relinquish that polarity, and if you equalize that, they don't know who they are. And it's, it's 
I mean, it only begets compassion when you see that. But they're so tied up in descriptions and meaning that without meaning, they freak out. They give meaning to not having meaning, being death. And in a way it is. It's death of the illusion of the describer that hopes for pleasure and happiness in something being more meaningful than something else. If you look at your life, the reason you do anything is because you think one thing will be more meaningful than another. Even for me that's the case, except I don't identify with it, at least not that I can tell most of the time. So, meaning that if I see there's greater benefit in something, then I will do that something over that something else. It's the mechanism of choice. It's the mechanism of how we make decisions. But when you relinquish all personal attachment to your personal biases and personal meanings, then what arises, instead of chasing what you believe has the most meaning, you start contributing to what where you detect is the most benefit. And benefit is in, intrinsically one with everything. It, it's not about you or them. It's just what is the most beneficial for the all that is. What seems the most accelerative or the most releasing or the most liberating or the most helping the one infinite creator wake up to itself. That's the benefit you start detecting once your radar is clean of debris. Then you become the God radar. Your radar becomes God's radar. You're tuned into the same radar as God, which detects within the relative, within the illusion, detects or has this natural intelligence, these waves that notice or register what is required to generate the most benefit in any situation that is possible within the agreements or the free will of that particular domain of the illusion. You shift from chasing meaning to contributing to where naturally intelligence tells you, tells your body, tells your mind what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to do it, to whom to do it. And it's not about you. Because as soon as your happiness is found within, your life starts to shift. It's not about you anymore. Because the only reason you think your life is about you is because, first of all, you think that there is a you that is apart from the self. And secondly, because you think there is a you that's apart from the self, you think this self can be attacked by another self. But there is no other self. That only exists when you describe something. Before that, there is only the vastness of love business awareness. And before that, there is only the absolute source, from which love isness awareness was the first, only and final distortion or expression.